I got up to water my lawn. That's how excited it was. <laughs> I thought you said uh, watermelon. It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's superhero slate. It's a modern podcast where we talk about everything that's great. Like movies, TV, superheroes. It's superhero slate. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Superhero Slate, the show where we run down the latest superhero entertainment news. We love TV, movies, and superheroes, so let's talk it all out. My name is Chris Dillard. And my name is Mike Royer. And this week, we have trailers, multiple for Shang-Chi and the Suicide Squad. Mm Mm-hmm. And we literally Shazam shows off new suits. I think we've talked about the first one before, but now Mm -hmm. we get the whole family of suits. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And more. Transformers will finally give us Beast Wars and more. <laughs> Man, it's been a uh, it's been a draining week physically because depending on where you live in different parts of the world, uh, we're getting really familiar with the heat index, Chris, over here in Southern California. Mm-hmm. We have been in like the tens, which I had to look up the index because I was like, well, 10, that kind of seems like the top of the chart, right? So I Googled it and I realized the heat index um, goes in groupings from like zero to three, like three to six, and then like six to 10 or or something like that. And then there's just a standalone 11, which makes you really depressed when you think about it, because more than likely the scientists invented this and go, oh, it'll never go above 10. We'll, we'll cap Mm -hmm. it right at 10. That'll be safe. And then they had to amend it and add an 11. Uh, So I don't know if we, (laughs) I'm going to go the other way and say someone was watching. This is spinal tap and was like, (laughs) this is, this is rookie level. If we want people to know what's hot, we're going to add an 11 to it. We're Mm -hmm. going to, we're we're just going to turn that 10 into an 11. 11 and just adjust everything below it man yeah It'll so these cool. are so but these are the cool days hot <laughs> so these are the days i'm glad we make a podcast where i have an excuse to be inside yeah. away from the sun that will burn you because i believe in the higher levels of the heat index they say if you have kind of like medium to fair skin i guess kind of like average skin for a lighter tone you can burn like in under like 10 minutes or something like mm-hmm. that so without screen sunscreen so, so, so I'm glad i'm inside at- <laughs> As a pale person myself who has taken it upon a lot of uh, home landscaping today, I actually have an (laughs) app on my watch and phone that goes by the UV index. And it tells me how long my pale ass can be in the sun before (laughs) I'm going to start burning. Uh, It's usually about 10 to 15 minutes, but you can adjust if you add sunscreen or not, and it'll tell me. So, Well, uh, we... We are officially uh, men of a certain age, so I think it's mm-hmm. safe for you to go ahead and buy one of those really big sun hats. Oh, I got yeah. one of those last year. comes in really handy. keeps the sun off of your neck. It, it makes you look like an old curmudgeon, but I understand why the old curmudgeons uh, wear them now. They're very practical. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm still wearing my backwards hats, man. I think I just, I just took it off for the show. That's, that's how cool I am. I'm the cool guy <laughs> running down, driving down there. But... uh uh yeah uh, let's let's jump into what we're watching we've got a special mm-hmm. surprise on this episode and um I'm, I'm, I'm trying to save it for later so i don't i don't want to i don't expose what we're doing mike um but <laughs> I, I want people to know so let's jump into what we're watching because i'm really excited yes well before we get to quote unquote a sweet treat that might be here uh in a couple of minutes uh we finished watching season one of sweet tooth uh a relatively quick watch of only being eight episodes but we had a great time. Definitely sets it up for more seasons. Um, you know, this is a show about like hybrids between like humans and animals and the, the gradients that are in between there. So you get to kind of meet some more friends along the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think they're uh, implementing some uh, puppetry with some of these characters and aug- augmenting it with CG. So I thought that was pretty cool. Makes these characters a little bit more charming. So I'm excited to see where it goes. Uh, great cliffhanger. Uh, so mm-hmm. hopefully this isn't a Netflix situation where either for some bizarre reason it gets canceled uh, or it runs into some sort of crazy production uh, delay and we have to wait two years, you know, all the Stranger Things to get more. Um but I would assume, even though I've never read the comic books, that, you know, maybe the character of Sweet Tooth 
re- remains ageless. You know, a lot of times oh. in like comic books, you don't have to really age up your characters that often. But the actor that plays Sweet Tooth in the show will eventually age because it is a real human being actor. So it would be kind of interesting if this does go on for a, a while, much like Stranger Things. I would like to see the character grow and yeah. age because they're kind of naive at the very beginning of the show uh, because it's structurally supposed to be that way. So it would be kind of cool to see yeah. that happen within this uh, within this TV it- show. Yeah, it, it's so um, I've I've read the book and he he does age up, but like there's no like time jumps or anything mm-hmm. in the book. But um, you know, again, just just reading articles like what's different and stuff like that. I do know uh, they've taken a much lighter tone and and not really given some of the characters yeah uh, some, for, some for, of the plot point points yeah. So for example, if you wanna if you want an idea of what the tone is is like here. Uh, there is experimentation on these uh, characters uh, at, at some points. And basically, when the buzzsaw turns on and the scientist is maybe about to dig in, literally, uh, the, the scene transitions. So you're yeah. not really kind of getting like HBO grotesque, like primetime Sunday night, like just gore. But, you know, they're, they're toting this line. This is something oh. that you could probably safely watch with kind of like your yeah. mature middle schooler. Or yeah. maybe a high schooler. Uh, yeah, this isn't exactly for like the hardcore yeah. nerds or the the little kids. Yeah, I, I, again, and spoiler alert for the comic. One of the biggest things is is the difference is that the character Jeopard, um, Jep, he is literally working with the scientist to get the essentially the bones of his wife back. Uh, so like that's how like dark and kind of weird it gets in the, in the book a little bit. So. Um, but they've not announced season two, but Robert Downey Jr. and his wife Susan Downey are producers on that, right? So um, really hoping they kind of kind of go down that route. Yeah, and I do and know at the very beginning of Netflix's Geeked Week, uh, the uh, the two two main leads, I believe, were in some sort of like interview yeah. or some sort of like little buzz piece. So they they understand mm-hmm. it's a nerdy show, but it was at the very beginning of Sweet Tooth, kind yeah. of when Net- and Geek Week uh, Geek Week took off. So who who knows exactly what the numbers are? But yeah, Sweet Tooth yeah. season one, I w- I would check it out for sure yeah all right next one teeing it up over i didn't even know this was new but we were just browsing apple tv the other day we saw that there's this 54 minute documentary called who are you charlie brown which is a documentary about uh charles schultz uh who is the creator of peanuts so uh i'm i love comic strips i grew up um uh reading the sunday funnies if you will so i I clicked this right away and gave it a watch and I, I really didn't know much about Charles Schultz, but you kind of get a nice little look into his life. He seemed like a very, very sweet man that just really loved creating comics and doing what he did. But it, it's a very kind of glossed over uh, documentary. Like, I don't know if this man had a lot of drama in his life, but it's very much like a no warts included style documentary. So, like I said, I don't know if there's a whole lot there to uncover, but if there is, it's not in this one. Uh, they also do these kind of very highly produced little animated segments with uh, Charlie Brown um, uh, throughout the documentary, which are very nice, uh, all like voice acted. It kind of follows this uh, this theme of Charlie Brown having to write an essay about himself and then kind of intercuts with the documentary of um, Schultz. So I found it a little distracting, though, just because I was so interested in learning about him and the, his past and how he created Peanuts that I didn't really want to keep cutting back to this little kind of Charlie Brown story. But, you know, uh, it's a very much a family friendly documentary. So you can pretty you can pretty safely watch this one without having to worry like, oh, is Charles Schultz like a a cocaine womanizer? If he was or wasn't, it's not in the documentary, but it's very sweet. And I didn't really know exactly how he um, how he died and left this earth. And it's just they have some, you know, footage of not long before he passed. And it's very sweet. Might bring a tear to your eye. But that's over on Apple Plus. So, you know, if you're in between watchings of ted lasso season one and ted lasso season two dropping in july i i I have watched this i did watch this um Mm -hmm. i think it sucks oh really i I, I think i don't enjoy documentaries where it's just celebrities saying yeah i watched this Mm -hmm. yeah i liked it there's literally who are the experts here in this in this documentary was my problem and that's kind of what brought it on my radar they're like oh look we made it like someone saying they made a cheap documentary for charlie brown with celebrities and i'm like 
Oh, that's sad. I mean, I, the, I would think a good way to describe this documentary, this is equivalent to the documentary stuff that Disney Plus is making about Disney. Because yeah. I know Apple doesn't own Charlie Brown, but they're very much invested in kind of the Peanuts cinematic universe, right? Oh, they have the, like they have all, they have a whole bunch of Peanuts stuff over at Apple Plus. So they, they bought it, it. They actually Apple does own the license to Charlie Brown. Oh, I didn't realize that. So yes, that, that's where this came from. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's why you're not gonna get any sort of anything that's edgy. <laughs> Just like when you're watching like the documentary well, about the Disney theme parks, that you're not gonna get all this kind of like a shady stuff about like yeah. Walt and some of well, his like the, union busting business I, practices back in the I, day. <laughs> I don't think anyone has anything against Schultz. I mean, I don't think he has any skeletons in his closet. I think the biggest thing was when he introduced again Al Roker. I think was the only person I enjoyed on here when they introduced Franklin you know right after the assassination of Martin Luther King you know, like nobody dropped his comic strip because they introduced someone of color like that mm. was like his you know he was pretty he was pretty pretty solid but I mean I just don't like it when like it's like watching what, what MTV used to make their they just have celebrities like yeah I, I once I met this guy to show once and here's my story. Like, yeah, I speaking of, I'm like, oh. Speaking of uh, Stranger Things, they had one of the actors from Stranger Things as one of those talking heads, and they had a few other younger faces. Yeah. And I get why they need to bring in some of the younger kind of um, people to ask because, like, oh, look, it, it tr transcends all of these generations. But they basically didn't have much to add to the conversation. They were just like, mm -hmm. oh, Charlie Brown, he's very cool. I like reading comic yeah. strips. And it's like, okay, yeah. kid. Uh, if you want a really, really good documentary about like kind of uh, classic comic strips, there's a documentary just called Stripped. I don't know if it's uh, streaming anywhere, uh, but it's great, and it talks about all the whole history of comic strips and how it evolved onto the internet, and they talk to a lot of really influential uh, creators. Uh, so, yeah, go check out Stripped if you want to get really, it, really into it. Not streaming, but you can purchase it on all popular platforms. Yeah, totally worth it. But uh, last up here, there's this new movie on Hulu called False Positive that we decided just to kind of on a whim watch last night, starring Alana Glazer, who you may know from uh, Broad City, and also starring Pierce Brosnan, which is our generation's James Bond. Um, and he was also in Eurovision Song Contest last year, and I really enjoyed his performance in that, so... False Positive is a very, very wild A24 movie uh, that has a, a, a very much a vibe to it, if you will. It fits that A24 kind of uh, discography uh, lineup very, very well. Uh, it doesn't quite stick the ending for me, unfortunately, but, you know, you do kind of get some cool little filmmaking uh, tricks here and there, but uh, a lot of people online were comparing it to a lesser rosemary's baby and i had never seen rosemary's baby so i don't really know exactly what that comparison means but uh if, if you were on the fence of this one if you even knew about it i think you could probably safely skip a uh, false positive uh oh. very much not safe for work some bizarre scenes in there but as weird as it got at some point in times i thought they could have taken it even further towards the end and really kind of uh fulfill the bizarre tone that they kind of feed you through the entire film but that's false positive uh, if you're a Pierce Brosnan completionist, I suppose you'll have to watch this at some point in time. But, you know, after you wrap this one, just go rewatch Eurovision Song Con yeah. Contest again. That'll be a good end. Uh, he, he's also Mamma Mia, right? Like, he, he's, he's, a, he's a good time. I like, mm -hmm. I like Pierce Brosnan. Uh, I'm going to shift gears into something also very dark. I started watching Dexter for the very first time. Oh, uh, Dexter. I, I, that might be my very first, like, prestige drama I ever watched in my entire yeah. life. Uh, my my friend from the show, friend Brian, uh, really really enjoys the show. I know, remember uh, hearing about it a lot in college mm -hmm. uh, when we were going in together. Uh, people uh, in my film classes, we we always studied the intro to the the show, like the oh yeah, the close ups, the cut ups, and the music and stuff like that. And um, I I never watched it, but I found I know the new seasons coming up, like mm -hmm. the revival or whatever. And uh, come to find out, you know, it's on Amazon Prime for free all the seasons. So. Uh, I've had some more downtime at night lately, so I've just kind of been throwing on Dexter for a while. I'm uh, still in the first season, uh, cranking through, enjoying it. Um, uh, it's not as Are gory you... as I thought, but I, I love the mysteries. Yeah, like I'm, I'm sure you're aware of all of the kind of like yes. the drama and quality of the the show as it goes on. But uh, do you know exactly when kind of everybody says the drop off starts? I, yeah, I'm I, just kind of curious if you if I, you know what to expect, when to expect I, it. I couldn't tell you which season offhand but i know it has to do with the guy who did iron fist and the inhumans 
So uh, whenever I see his name and I can't think of it off the top of my head, I know it will probably be pretty bad. <laughs> I, I, so. yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at this. Uh, pretty much about half of Dexter is really, really, really good. And then you're yeah. going to fluctuate a lot through yeah. <laughs> through other parts of it. But I'm really curious to follow your journey throughout Dexter. So please yeah. update me along the way. Yeah. Yeah, gonna gonna do that, and then lastly, I finally got to watch Luca this week. Right after we talked about it on yeah. Sunday, um, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's just one of those uh, again. Uh, any Pixar movie with a cat, I'm already in love with. <laughs> uh, and the cat in this is very hilarious. He has mm-hmm. the same mustache as the dad, mm-hmm. and um, it's very much like a like I. I want to attack the fish people kind of thing. <laughs> uh, what was cool about this one? And this isn't like you know the existential drama that is. Uh, the the last one soul of that mm-hmm. Pixar put out this is way more lighthearted this is way easier to watch and it's just about guys having fun and being friends um and the voice actor of um uh the the, the kid uh, not the main kid the second one the, his the trouble friend kid. I, yeah. I kept forgetting his name is it Alfonso or am I making or, that up is it Alfredo never... maybe <laughs> it's Something not like it's, it's not Italian. Luca I can tell you that because yeah. it's not Luca it's not Juliet um. Yeah, whatever his name. Alberto. It's Alberto. There you go. Um, but uh, he he's also uh, he's one of the I think he's the main kid in uh, Shazam actually, um, who played mm. the like the young version of Shazam or or his friend one of the two. So uh, he has some superhero connections. There. I, it's a fun time. It was it ended on a way more positive note, much quicker than I expected. But it was still pretty fun. Yeah, I I, th- I, th- I thought it was fine. You know, I yeah. thought a lot of people went on the internet and they seemed to uh, fawn over the film. And I was like, yeah, it's okay. You know, it, it, yeah. it's not like a top tier Pixar movie in, yeah. in my opinion. The visuals, of, co- of course, are great. I always love yeah. the visuals in Pixar films. And I love how they decided with this one to kind of maybe go a little bit more creative with some of the character designs and some of the, the mm-hmm. some of the posing for the characters. And the town is obviously beautiful. Uh, the one time that I got to visit Italy a few years ago, we visited uh, one of the cities that inspired the location of Luca. So that was cool to kind of see Pixar, you know, adapt a place that I had been to before. That was really, really neat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I kind of wanted a little bit more of the mythos overall. Like, I didn't really need to get them nitty-gritty, but, uh, like, I needed to know a little bit more about the mermaid society to kind of care about it overall. They never really explain why they can turn into humans. They don't really tell us the scale of the mermaids that live off the coast. Like, how long have they been there? Why don't they know Alberto? Like, what happened to his dad? Like, I know you can say, like, oh, well, you can infer maybe some things that had happened to his dad but like they really don't give you anything not even like a nugget of information about what happened so i just wanted a little bit more about the story and i also thought like maybe luca's arc could have been a little bit stronger i do like how eventually he ends up going to school like i can see a disney plus series all over this of luca at a human school shorts little shorts of yeah and they they gave you like almost a little hint of that uh in the post credit or in the credits which was kind of nice but i was like well what was luca's arc in the story like we meet him and he's just kind of like a like a bored farmer. He doesn't really have like a passion necessarily for humans on the mm. surface necessarily. He just kind of like what doesn't really want to be a fish farmer anymore. He's, like it, it I just think he's just curious. I think he's just curious. And, yeah. and that's what it was like. His, his trait is curiosity. Yeah. You almost like expected him to say like, no mom, I want to go up there or like, I want to see more of the world. I want to go do things. And like, they weren't really actively yeah. stopping him from doing that. They're just like, just don't go up to the surface. Uh, the uncle character mm. was hilarious. Yes. That was yeah. great. And if you're watching it on uh, Disney plus, um, I don't usually I'm watching when I'm watching something streaming. And if I want to know if there's a post credit scene, right, you wait to see if any suggestion tiles pop up. Oh, if a suggestion tile pops up, oh, that means it's done and over with. But I think with yeah. Luca, you get the little suggestion pops up pop ups before you ever get to the very, very, very end. So you need to fast forward to the very, very end of the movie. If you want to see a funny little tidbit mm-hmm. with the uncle again at the end. So yeah, that character was weird. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and this uh, this is from the guy who did the La Luna short um, for Pixar years ago. You might mm-hmm. remember that the, the character models are the exact same he used there. Um, you know, Italian, you know, kind of kind of minded as well. So it's cool to see them. I did see some behind the scenes stuff where they actually sculpted a lot of the characters um, before they put them in in CG world. Mm-hmm. So um, that's fun. To, you know, they're they're doing a lot more with these I think than just drawing them on paper. Like, okay, make this come to fruition but luca was very fun it's very i mean it's it's a it's a breeze for what hour and a half it, it goes by so quickly it's a good time so 
We recommend that. All right, let's jump into this, Mike. We have show notes to go over. Superhero stuff to talk about. Obi-Wan Kenobi. I was actually just playing Star Wars Squadrons, the, the flight game with my flight stick and stuff, right before we mm-hmm. jumped on here, Mike. Uh, it's been a fun game. But there's speculation that Obi-Wan may face off against an Inquisitor in the upcoming show. Are you familiar with the Inquisitorious? Uh, a little bit, but not a whole lot. So the Inquisitors are essentially Jedi hunters that were trained that were essentially under Vader. So essentially mm. a lot of them were um, Jedi that were corrupted uh, and, and turned to the dark side and, and put in this Inquisitorious program. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was like the um, Grand, I think the Grand Inquisitor, and they were like the first brother and the second sister and all these other ones. You face off a couple of them in that uh, the Star Wars game, uh, uh, Fallen Order, that mm-hmm. you haven't finished yet. Um, and, but they were introduced in Star Wars Rebels. So this would be really cool. To see Obi Wan have a really, I mean, this is his chance to have that epic lightsaber battle, right? Like mm-hmm. in, in his show without having to face Darth Vader directly. I say it every time. If you have to distill Star Wars down to one physical thing, it is the lightsaber. It's the most mm-hmm. iconic thing to come out of that franchise. Now you might say, "Oh, the line, may the Force be with you," or maybe the mm-hmm. the sound effect of like Darth Vader's Darth Vader, Darth Vader. Oh God, <laughs> that'd be a crossover for sure. But the lightsaber is so iconic, and I feel like you you don't always get a lot of that. You know, we didn't even really get much of it until season two of Mandalorian, and mm-hmm. we get a lot of it with Ahsoka, which is awesome. She's got those double blades, but yeah, light lightsaber on lightsaber ooh that's great and, and I, I would love to see some um some more choreography yeah. around that and and we know kenobi you know is heralded as one of the best lightsaber duelists of you know uh-huh. the jedi era of that so that'd be cool to see those i, I would i would like to think it would be a really really good one um, it, i think one the- thing i don't know how much time is going to pass in the obi-wan show and if you and mcgregor is signed on for multiple seasons or multiple projects with other streaming shows so I don't know how much aging we'll see with this character, but it will be kind of interesting to see him slow down, right? He is like so iconically uh, um, un- in in mobile <laughs> in the in the classic Star yeah. Wars trilogy, right? You know, slow and steady. Yeah, exactly. Will. So like, who knows? Maybe he'll I, maybe he'll get some sort of injury in this mm-hmm. show, and it'll really slow him down permanently or something like that. But uh, yeah, man, I can't wait to see more Ewan McGregor. Yeah. I, I think this is, again, one of our, our most anticipated Star Wars properties coming up, and uh, they are filming it. So, you know, it is a, it is a reality, Mike. We're not just, we're not just <laughs> dreaming. Uh, I've got a Twitter thread for you. I know you're a big big Twitter thread fan of the Eternals, Marvel's Eternals. It's not the Eternals. Mm-hmm. I've learned this. It's Marvel's Eternals. And their early concept art shows off a lot of various deviant designs for the films, the villains of the film, if you will. And what I can gather from this is, uh, I don't know if any of these will ever come to... Um, fruition in the movie, but a lot of them look like, you know, things that myths and, like, you know, uh, monsters of legends and, and, like, you know, religion are based on. Yeah, the that's exactly what I was thinking when I was looking at this. Uh, so we'll we'll talk about beasts a little bit more here yeah. in, a, in a segment or show, but I'm on uh, Marvel MCU Beast Watch uh, yeah. because it's, a, it's an aspect of the universe that we haven't really delved into, you know, in, unless you count some of the stuff that has been in the mythical realm of Thor and some of his earlier films. Uh, and then also like alien stuff. But we haven't seen a whole yeah. lot of uh, Earth-centered beasts. So when that first Eternals trailer dropped, we did get that brief shot of some haunches, I feel like, of a deviant. Yeah. But, it, but you know, you described the deviant to me more as kind of like a shapeshifter, kind of like almost like demon or alien. Really, really yeah. it's technically alien if you think about it. So it's not really a beast by the definition that I'm giving it. But if you yeah. look at these kind of concept arts, these are very, very beastly. Uh, yeah. You know, I was expecting more of an amorphous kind of shape-shifting blob, but this is well, these are skeletal yeah. structures with scales and hair and horns. and every, There is one screenshot of something that does very much look like that, a demon. That uh, second one, yeah, the one you're talking about with the demon is probably, I think, more akin to what they'll look like in the, in, in the movie. Um, Mm -hmm. with these early but it sounds like you know maybe there were other deviants over time right like maybe like they all didn't come down to that one look at at once like there's one here that looks like it could be like a werewolf or like a chupa cabra or something like like a vampire or something yeah i don't know what this frog is supposed to be it looks like something out of like a skyrim character or something (laughs) like that like yeah so who knows if these are all shelved i think this last one is is the creepiest one the elongated limbs kind of just like the flesh skull on top and kind of looks like something out of like stranger things and you know bring that back yeah or something that i would kill in bloodborne or something like that uh but yeah yeah who knows how um 
why we're getting to see these and what maybe is not left on the table. We're really familiar with Marvel concept design, actually. Uh, the I, I think we both follow a lot of the concept artists over at Marvel. Yeah. And after a couple of years, once a project wraps up, they're usually pretty open about sharing stuff that didn't make it to the screen. And a lot yeah. of the times... I, I feel like I never see anything that's too wild, right? Never something that's just like, oh, wow, this idea was so far out of left field. I'm surprised they didn't pick that one. It's usually just more of like little variations, right, on costumes or something like mm. that. So, yeah, maybe if, if, you, if you kind of average all of these kind of designs together, maybe you kind of start to see what we might see in the film. Yeah, and again, I, I collect all the art books and I usually put like, here's the 20, like it's like choosing a... a, a when you're building a character in a video game, right? You're like, oh, it's the same yeah. person, but here's like 20 iterations of that one thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've got I've got all the art books, and I, I expect some of this might pop up in those. Uh, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, so we'll knock on wood. I'm going to talk about something hot off the presses, Mike. This is so hot, we Ooh, literally yeah. popped up while we were uh, getting ready to record. Wandavision. There has been a slight change to some of the foliage and possibly a shadow. In um, the end credit scene of the show. Oh, this is great. This, I, I love this type of news because there's so many things that you can speculate on just within this one bullet, you know? Yeah. So you're like, well, why is it greener? Why is it fuller? What What is change? And then, you know, why? I've included the video from a, from a tweet showing it looks like possibly someone floating down. Uh, you know, rumor is it could be like a Doctor Strange kind of thing or like yeah. something that they didn't really mask out properly. Yeah. And, but, you know, if you if you had to paint it, you know, visually for somebody that's not quite c- clicking on the link, if you remember the post credit scene in WandaVision, you have like this big sweeping establishing shot before you see Wanda at her cabin. And before you walk into the cabin, you know, and you see her doing the astral projection and everything, you have this sweeping shot that goes over a lake. And this uh, person on Twitter recognized that some of the foliage off to the left of the cabin has mm-hmm. almost kind of been like upgraded. Like the original scene uh, was like a, the trees were a little bit thinner, a little bit more, gr- little less green. And now they, someone has gone in and added more foliage to it. And I guess in the original scene, there's some sort of like static, like shadow or silhouette of something in the background, but it doesn't look like filmmaking, like silhouette, right? It doesn't look like it's supposed to be there. It almost looks like an artifact from the editing process like there was like they just left like a null object left behind in the editor and somebody forgot to take it out so i feel like the most logical explanation is somebody realized oh shit we forgot to take this random artifact out of the post credit scene of wandavision well let's go back in and take it out and then while they were in there maybe they were just like oh we also forgot to turn on this layer for extra trees let's just turn on this layer while we're already in here and re-export it and send it over to the disney plus servers I feel like that's the most logical explanation, but if I had to spin my wheels and just go wild, you know, I would think it sounds like, you know, Disney Plus and the creators over there do not have problems with going back in and making touch-ups and cleaning things up, which, you know, isn't well, so out of the realm of possibility. I mean, they removed the Starbucks cup uh, over at HBO for Game of Thrones in that last season. So, I guess this is kind of the advantage of like a digital first thing being published like i don't think that there's any physical copies of wandavision out there right i haven't heard of any box sets or blu-rays they're not releasing any of the disney plus stuff on physical uh, yeah so i mean but if that's the origin you don't have to really worry where what's out of date right you're actually saying this backwards. The artifact slash Doctor Strange is in there now, not on the oh, original. Version. Like, well, like maybe you've they, actually. Like, well, maybe so, they just fucked up twice. They're like, God damn it, we have to go back in for a third time. Yeah. So uh, there, there is the other theory that you know, why would you make a change of a post credit scene? Why would you do this? Well, the original theory was Doctor Strange was supposed to be in this post credit scene. They actually filmed it with Benedict Cumberbatch, but they don't want to didn't want to take away from Wanda's thing. Well, the other thing is, if you've been watching Loki, there was just a large event. Um, in episode two that could be changing the timeline for every everybody now i think this would be fun if they were able to go in and you know, change some of these scenes to 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 match that but i don't think it serves anything in the long run like that would make no sense just to update the post credit scene to then change it back later if things mm-hmm. get fixed so i i don't know what's going on or why they're doing this but we, i also mentioned you know they haven't really gone back and fixed mark hamill's face in uh, the mandalorian <laughs> finale so um, I figured that'd be a higher priority than some trees in WandaVision. This is, <laughs> yeah. I just I want to know what's kind of going on here. So yeah, I think the little end of his uh, of this user's Twitter v- video is the uh, is the thing that you want to yeah. take the most credence from. Of just like, 
uh, he was obviously joking, or is this Mephisto kind of at work again? Like, let's not get all Mephisto-y about this again. Uh, I, this really does just feel like somebody going back in and trying to fix something that was uh, that was maybe uh, broken. I, yeah. I don't know. We, we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure. Is it, yeah, they they um, sometimes they'll fix little things here and there, and, and they have the opportunity to do so now without most people noticing. But they've got people watching this pretty hardcore. I mean, this could uh, be this could be totally off base. But who knows? This could be a legal thing, too. Like, you know, more than likely that establishing shot has CG elements in it. If not, it could be entirely CG with the uh, with the capabilities that they have over there at Disney Plus and Marvel. Uh, maybe somebody accidentally downloaded a, a tree 3D model that they didn't have the license to. And someone very litigious found out that that tree is in there and they didn't pay for the license and they had to go in and like remove it. Mm. Like that's such little minutia that we would probably never hear about, right? Like no one's going to write an yeah. article about the tree that wasn't supposed to be there. Well, actually, no, somebody actually would. Yeah, but, right. you know, it could be as something as like just meticulous as that. It, yeah. It's just at a weird time when people are watching this stuff because of yeah. other things going on. So I yeah I I would love to be the person who was actually watching this over and over to see if anything changed or how they found out it changed right like yeah like what, what's what's the what's the indicator yeah the I don't file? know it's so weird I love the internet though uh, you know if you get enough eyes on anything nobody can put anything by you yeah yeah exactly so yeah so we're gonna we're gonna keep an eye on this see if it's anything else changes or if it's just uh just a little fun thing this is something like you know Fortnite would do or you know video games so mm-hmm. do that. Uh, shifting gears, surprise drop on Thursday. A Thursday, Shang Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings gave us our first big teaser trailer, if you will. And uh, let me tell you, uh, ten rings all over this place. We get to see. <laughs> yeah. We get to see all those ring powers. Yeah, we get to see them all. Uh, we get to see half of them. We get to see them shared. We get to see them yeah. glow different colors. Uh, it looked like so. The, I, I don't know if you know when they shared them and like at the end there, it looked like Mortal Kombat, like Scorpion versus Sub Zero oh. because of the yellow versus blue kind of thing. Uh, but um, um, we get yeah. a couple. We get a couple new beasts, if yep. you will, uh, in, in this trailer. Um, I mean, Simu Liu, yep. he, he's just great. I'm looking to see. Uh, he he had a he had a really funny line towards the end of the trailer. I don't remember exactly what it was, uh, but I remember uh, laughing at it. Um, but yeah, th- this is shaping up to be pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really excited for this, and uh, I, I've been I've been talking about the creature watch. So we have like a mythical creature from from looks like uh, the Asian culture, right? Um, then there's an underwater dragon, which I've seen we've seen in Funko Pops, but I think. The biggest thing here, which is both sad and cool at the same time, is no one's talking about Shang Chi. No one's talking about the Ten Rings. We're talking about <laughs> Abomination at the end of this coming. Yeah, back yeah, yeah. This is force. this is the big news for sure. But, but before we get to it, just real quick, uh, uh, around like a minute twenty-five in the trailer is when you do kind of get that lion slash dog. Yes, the the, uh, the mythical creature. Yeah. Creature, and I and I'm going frame by frame right now, and for the first time, I'm noticing like this is kind of like a big like uh, battle depiction. You know, we. Got lots of stuff going on here, and you seem to have like these um, monk style of uh, people. I-, I would assume that they are the heroes because they're facing off of these all black kind of villains, and they have like these glowing staffs, like these glowing type of weaponry. Yeah. So I don't know exactly what that is so if they're enchanted or they- if it's technology or what exactly is going on here because they're wearing. I can't tell if it's medieval armor, but it kind of almost looks ballistic in nature. So I don't know if this is present day. That or if this is indeed a flashback, because I think we've been assuming I, that this is a flashback having this mythical creature, but I don't know. Maybe so, we're bringing these mythical creatures to the present day. I, I think it's modern based on the this the first trailer or sneak peek or whatever it is called gave us I think a better view of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and in this we get to see Michelle Yeoh training Shang Chi a little bit. It's like she's like kind of like moving wind around, right? Like with mm-hmm. the this stuff. I think that's her village and her people and the Ten Rings is attacking them to because you see her him fighting her later uh, kind of thing so I think they're like in this mythical realm what if I, I don't think it's the um, what's the Iron Fist land called um Oh God, uh, I can't even remember that yeah. show so far out of my head. And yeah, I know the, you should know it from the comic books, but yeah. I can't quite remember. Right. So it's like a probably a mythical land protected by some mythical barrier kind of thing. So I think it's present day. I think that's like the heat, like the Ten Rings is going to attack them because you know Shang Chi is there, and that like it's just like a Darth Vader thing. Like he's like trying to go after his kid because his kid probably going to take over the mantle one day. But um, 
Yeah, I, 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 before all that stuff, it looks cool. You get to see the rings like do some wind stuff. He's throwing the rings. They seem to be like explosive. They're channeling water. There's like that crossing. It looks like Shang Chi's got the, some of them, and he's got some of them. So I really want to know who, how do they determine who the rings go to, and 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 what their full power set kind of yeah. is in this. It's a, it's and I like, I love, I love that armbands. By the way, yeah, it's a battle for these rings. Uh, it, yeah, people are trying to guess if this dragon is or isn't Fing Fang Foom. It is not. Uh, is it even real? You know, is this a dream sequence? Is this, you know, some sort of vision he might have? Well, you know, we've seen stuff like that happen in the MCU before, and we're getting a lot more mythical with this. And speaking of mythical, we're trying to, you know, kind of put ground these yeah. magical powers, and you you would expect to find a sorcerer, and I think yeah. we do get to see a sorcerer in this trailer. So, so I've been going by his frame by frame. Abomination shows up, and who is he fighting? Someone with a sling ring and sorcerer powers, and mm-hmm. it, it 99% looks like Wong, uh, to be completely honest. But I don't see him being in a cage fight kind of thing. Um, uh, and, you know, but I I don't remember. Did he get? Did he didn't get zapped? Did he or did he not? Uh, you mean? I uh, yeah, I I you snapped. So like, you know, is this something he started picking up in his spare time? Uh, well, everybody yeah, was yeah, away, it's hard what? to tell. Like. The, the the silhouette and body shape of this character in the cage match with Abomination does kind of give off Wong vibes. And there is a sling ring. You do see this magicka going on. So I could see it going either way, right? If, yeah. if the character is intentionally supposed to lose to show kind of like the strength of Abomination of, oh, he can take on sorcerers, you know, before Simu Liu gets yeah. in there and fights him. Uh, you know, it could just be uh, uh, basically a, a faceless sorcerer. Yeah. We saw a lot I, of those at the end of Endgame, right? They all came out of a portal. We realized, yeah. oh, there's a bunch of these dudes out there. Uh, I could see Abomination yeah. just uh, killing off one of them. And we yeah. see it, it, in this footage that he is, like, beating this uh, sorcerer's butt, throws him right into the, the chain wall. Mm-hmm. So is this or isn't Wong? I'm not 100% sure, but, you know, I'm sure they could find an explanation for Wong being there, right? Right. Well, I think that if you had, if you couldn't get Benedict Cumberbatch, you could get this like Wong. But I think it's going to go the other way. I think the sorcerer is going to beat Abomination, and it's going to be like one of those lessons like brute strength isn't as powerful, you know, as magic is kind of thing. Um, but I also notice in the Abomination thing, it, it's he's got his ears have grown into like the fin style. Ears yeah, he's got from some upgrades. Books. Yeah, yeah he, he's a little different than that. And we know that um, you know he if he. I, I hope this isn't some sort of like you know bait and switch. It's like some sort of like fake show rather than an actual thing. I hope it's a real fight. But he will be also be in She Hulk um, down the road. They they confirmed last year. So um, I want to say this is probably the movie that ties back to the origins of the MCU more than anybody else because the Ten Rings have been Iron Man's villain since the literally like that's what gave him the chess piece, right? The Ten Rings mm-hmm. kidnapping him, and Abomination was the very first like or the second villain, standalone villain of the whole MCU in The Incredible Hulk, which people try to wipe away, but like just like the um, Thor The Dark World, those keep coming back into play more and more we, we try mm. to get rid of them. So I think this is really cool uh, if they if they pull this off. It looks like a really fun movie. I'm excited to see some more of the fights, but I know they're holding off on some of those fights. Uh, yeah, I mean, th- this is this is the big benefit of having a, uh, a cinematic universe a decade long behind you. Because when you make, like, imagine Shang-Chi being made in, in phase one, right? Like, the, everything that they put in the film, they're going to have to, like, pull out and flesh out from the very beginning and explain it. But, like, how great is this that now you can make a movie, and if you want to throw, like, a big green creature in it, like, oh, let's just put Abomination in it. You know, we'll write, like, maybe, like, one or two lines that kind of fill in what Abomination has been doing since the last time the Hulk whooped his butt, right? And then, like, that's it. You you have this character with established lore already, and it just adds a little bit more to the scene that you see. I mean, it's the whole reason why everybody, like, is talking about this one individual moment from the trailer, because it harkens back to uh, one of the very first MCU movies ever made, and I, I just think that's really cool. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think this is going to be fun, and we get to see some you know mis- mystical things we've not really seen before on Earth, and, and what these. I want to know who ends up with the Ten Rings and what do they do with them. That's what I want to know, and and also a fight tournament, so <laughs> a real fighting tournament. But to do this, Mike, you you pulled you pulled out some stunts here. You dug deep into the archives, and by archives, I mean a Twitter post or something. And um, found a <laughs> Shang Chi's peaches and cream cake recipe 
from Stan Lee's 1977 Super <laughs> Yeah, this was very interesting. You know, diving deep into Twitter threads when people are talking about the Shang-Chi trailer, and I came across this recipe called Shang-Chi's Peaches and Cream Cake, and I was like, what is going on here? Uh, I sent it to you, and we both just kind of decided, I think it's time that we make this cake to celebrate the trailer of Shang-Chi. Yeah. Uh, I made mine last night, gave it a try, I already have my opinion. Yep. Chris, you literally have a slice sitting in front of you I, right now. I have a whole plate but, right here. But Peaches before you dive right in, let me explain what this recipe is for the people yes. out there. So this is from like a, a cookbook from the 70s. So these aren't yes. really highfalutin, high-end recipes. It literally says half a package of butterscotch cake mix. So you can't <laughs> find that, that, I can't I couldn't find butterscotch cake mix. I don't know about you, Chris. No, no. We, we both could not find this. I don't think it exists anymore. Like this yeah. is a, a cake mix that doesn't exist. So we both had to take our own um interpretations of how to make butterscotch cake mix yeah i was lucky enough that my wife is a big baker and she had essence of butterscotch or like butterscotch extract or whatever you want to call it so i just added some of those drops to like a normal yellow cake mix and you went with the butterscotch put dry pudding packet yes. right to make your yes. cake you mix it in with the um the the, the actual cake mix uh, when you make it and it, it adds the flavor and that that's a that's an og move too because my wife has made cakes before when i told her that you were using jello he was just like oh that cake is going to be really really moist because mm -hmm. the gelatin in it really really helps and she's made cakes before that start with jello packets so that's like a legit move to make so that's good um so on top of that, after you make the cake, uh, you put a layer of a quarter cup of sour cream, which I think really anchors it to the 70s because I've never had sour cream with dessert before. I may have had it as an ingredient, as it, but never just like straight up sour cream. And then you put canned peaches on top of it with some brown sugar and then you broil it. So I did all that last night. Uh, you follow me over at Microwear Design on Twitter because I'm going to be posting pictures of what my cake looked like. Uh, I, I would assume follow Chris as well because he might uh, do that. I might, the same I might thing. do it. This, this thing so, has been destroyed since then. Mine's yes. a, so, again, because of that, it's softer. I'm not, again, it's, it's so Chris, part of the I, uh, please, I, I'm begging you, dive into your sour oh, yeah. cream oh. butterscotch peach cake right now. Oh, yeah. Let the people know what you think. I have formed, I formed Formed my opinions last night on this cake. Uh, me and my wife both gave it a shot. Uh, I, I think I turned out pretty well visually. I, I, I thought I took some pretty cool pictures of it. Um, so uh, you can definitely style this to look pretty fancy. Oh. But uh, I, I'd like Chris, okay. what, what, how are you how are you feeling over there? If I had some um, butterscotch crumble or like some cake crumble, I think this would taste. Mine would taste like a peach cobbler. Mm -hmm. And have the consistency of a peach cobbler. And uh, probably widely known fact, peaches are my favorite fruit. <laughs> so I'm already a huge fan of this. I, I, I really enjoy mine. The moisture, the sour cream is a little little interesting but i think the peaches <laughs> overpower it here the cake the cake is is very good to, in my in my world i don't think yeah. you had it's not such a good look yeah, yeah i don't know if i showed my hand earlier when i was talking yeah. about it yeah the sour cream is uh, it's just a little too off for me right you, usually when you see kind of like a white creamy portion of a dessert you're you think oh this is going to be like a decadent either sort of cream or frosting and then also, like, I'm not uh, I'm not totally alien to the idea of, you know, like sour mixing with sweet and, you know, having them play off of each other. But, yeah, for me, uh, the, the sour cream was a no go. Everything else about the cake I, I was really, really great. My favorite parts were I don't know if you got this when you broiled it, but the brown sugar kind of started to caramelize and crystallize around the edges. Mm -hmm. And that's great. But if you want a cake that is all about that, just eat a pineapple upside down cake because the entirety of that is covered in like crystallized brown sugar. And even better yet, make a peach upside down cake and just put some like whipped cream on the side. So I don't know if I could recommend this one, but it was fun to make. I had never made anything from like a Marvel Comics cookbook before. But we got the full recipe over in our show notes if you want to give it a shot mm. and see if maybe you can put a spin on it. Like, I feel like I've seen recipes before where there is, like, a cream that starts with sour cream. But it's not just mm. sour cream, right? It's like, okay, well, I had, like, a quarter cup of sour cream, you know, like, a quarter cup of cream cheese, you know, a little bit of powdered sugar. You know, I, I was expecting maybe something like that. So, yeah, this was wild. This was fun, though. Oh, man. I, I really don't – I don't get the sour cream as much because I, I love a sour cream – with like a chip or something like sour mm -hmm. cream and onion. I'm not getting the bitter sour cream. So I don't know if maybe the cake mix is overpowering it by a long shot, but um, 
I'd recommend this to anyone who likes peaches. I, this whole, I showed Mike the actual cookbook before we started this because I went and looked up where it came from. Uh huh. And they literally, like you said, just take regular recipes and just give them marble names. Um, yeah, and they're so, very easy. Like every recipe, every recipe on this spread was like start with a box ca- box cakes mix. Like nothing has more than like four or five ingredients, really. Yeah, the, the Hulk, uh, the Hulk burgers, I think was one of my favorite <laughs> things. But they do breakfast and everything, and um, Shang Chi looks really interesting. Uh, it didn't look like his character in here, so. Um, yeah, so, and I don't uh, know if I don't know if Shang Chi is supposed to kind of like rhyme with peaches and cream, or if it's just supposed to be kind of like, I don't want to say it's like alliteration because that's when kind of things start with like the same sound, but it almost like has like the same cadence of saying Shang Chi, peaches and cream. I don't know. I don't know how exactly they connected peaches <laughs> with Shang Chi, but when I googled it, I couldn't really find the recipe anywhere. But I was getting some results of peaches, so I don't know if there's like a character within the Shang Chi universe that goes by the name of Peach or Peaches or something like that. So I don't know what the connection is mm. here. Uh, sounds like Chris is recommending it. Uh, oh yeah. I think I'm just recommending make a peach upside down cake. Well, but either, if, either way, any excuse to eat cake is not a bad excuse. Well, I will include my recipe for the cake mix uh, in there, so you can anyone who wants to use it can use that rather than the one you mm-hmm. made, just in case. I don't, I don't <laughs> think I don't think your cake's bad. I, I just think maybe the the overpowering moisture of mine and sweetness is like yeah taking well over to the be sour cream. yeah to to be fair uh, my goal was to be as close to this recipe as possible oh. so even though i agree that your kind of cake base probably tastes really really good um I, you're kind of cheating yeah. using jello well oh. you can't you, you can't <laughs> make you can't find it man you gotta gotta improvise yeah. uh, I, i'm looking at this cookbook again there's one of the the shang chi's kung fu chicken and kung fu chop suey are two of his recipes <laughs> in here uh, so I'm like, oh, this is this is of its time. This is definitely <laughs> in the '70s for sure. Uh, Howard the Duck even has his own page under all kinds of chicken, by the way. So um, <laughs> it's pretty fun. Pretty fun. Well, uh, I'll save that for later. Um, moving on, our next trailer, The Suicide Squad, dropped earlier this week via mm. quote unquote leaks. Mike um, is where like the, the it, he was like, oh my god, they're leaking the trailer, but it was just the cast putting out, you know low quality versions of the trailer it looked like <laughs> and it was and a just strange, to hype for the full release, full release and it was a strange situation where like the advertising department over at warner brothers got the jump on the actual trailer because you found the trailer mm-hmm. in an ad on youtube for the link that i sent you for the bootleg which version was, of the trailer yeah. which was hilarious and the ad has a higher quality because it was the official trailer and the one i was watching was a bootleg yeah so um i gotta watch the trailer before the trailer and i was like <laughs> Here it is. So um, this one came out, and it gives us, uh, a, a, again, it looks like maybe the main character will be uh, Idris Elba's uh, blood, Bloodshot, right? Bloodshot? No, Bloodsport. Bloodshot, mm-hmm. that, that was Vin Diesel last year. If I remember <laughs> correct. Um, so it looks like Bloodsport shot Superman at some point, so that's why he's in the, the uh, thing here. So it confirms the existence of Superman in this world, right? So um, that's cool. We get to see... Um, you know, some of the teams getting together. You you pointed out this is another uh, movie where uh, Rick Flagg gets to stand in an airplane and explain everybody's uh, <laughs> powers and who they yeah. are. I'm sure he's really, really good at that, that actor. Um, one of the cool things, I'm just going to jump to the end. Uh, they don't call him King Shark. They call him Nanaway, which is King Shark's, like, real name. Like, mm-hmm. his real name. I was like, oh, that's really fun to, to like, give him his name rather than just call him King Shark because it's easier along mm-hmm. the way. Um. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, there wasn't a lot to really pull out of this, other than the fact that it just looks cool and looks fun. And they did mention Marvel. They like from the guy who brought you Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm like, oh, DC's piggybacking off Marvel's names now. <laughs> this is what world do we live in where this is, you know, the first thing this time has yeah. happened. We do get to see a little bit more of the starfish uh, throughout the trailer. Yeah. Um, yeah, some more jokes that we haven't seen <laughs> yeah. before about bubbles. I mean, everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything looks great. Uh, yeah, it does make me wonder if Bloodsport is kind of going to be the emotional connection for the audience, right? You know, because yeah. there are some cutaways to his uh, daughter, like maybe watching something on closed circuit television or something like that. So between our jokes, we'll kind of get our emotional grounding from the daughter that's just kind of watching his dad trying to redeem himself, which is kind of funny because that was um, 
that was oh god what was will smith's character called in the other suicide squad film deadshot deadshot yeah that's right i knew it was dead something that's funny because that's almost the same narrative that deadshot was going yeah. along of kind of like redeeming himself and his daughter's eyes from batman so it, it, it this does almost kind of feel like a redo of the film but uh i think my favorite part was just a uh, weasel getting really freaking weird in that uh that freight plane but yeah, yeah this is gonna be great can't wait to watch it yeah, I'm I'm excited. Again, this is an HBO Max um, and theater uh, same day, same release uh, property, which is cool for people who don't want to go back. I I like the idea. I just don't have to deal with people uh, in the movie theater. But you know, I uh, I, I will probably go watch this in theaters whenever tickets mm-hmm. go on sale. Um, I believe it's August, right? I think August. Shazam: Fury of the Gods. Uh, the director David Sandberg shows off the upcoming new suits for the whole Shazamily. Um, and an interesting thing here, I didn't. I thought I noticed this, but I didn't at first. So um, all these are the main actors, are the adult actors of the kids from the first movie, mm-hmm. except for um, the, the 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 girl in the red outfit. That's mm-hmm. actually the same actress. She plays the young version, which would be like you know, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, and the adult version of her this time around. Yeah, so that's actually, what. That- yeah, that's what I was thinking too. I guess maybe the ages are close enough to where you know they yeah. don't technically have to grow up to uh, yeah. fill out the suit. But yeah, do your very very best not to be attracted <laughs> in any sort of physical way to any of these characters because they are children. It's very mm-hmm. strange. Like they all look very much like gods. They're very trim. They're very fit. Yeah. They're the, the very s- buff. And it's like these are all children. So it's a yeah. very it's a funny kind of thing when you look at these. Like the dude yeah. on the right, he is so horizontal and it's yeah. all mass. He's the whitest person on this screen. And he, he like he's yeah, wow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is I mean, it's I like the look of their suits. Uh they look mm-hmm. again like Shazam has finally uh, even he had his own glow up, Mike, if you will. <laughs> uh, he he's shopping for some finer suits in this world because the other one I showed you the before is they were kind of just like they're solid. There's no definition. They're just kind of puffy looking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this this is more like oh, this is like kind of based on what Superman suit kind of looks like in the in the DCEU a little bit. So mm-hmm. uh, maybe they 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 modeled them after that. Looks good. And then the other image we have actually um, is Helen Mirren as the character Hesper in her outfit, which looks a little bit more. Uh, Wonder woman if I was going to be honest with you. Like something they'd see out in um, Themyscira on mm-hmm. somebody. So she's uh, one of the three daughters of a god in this movie who are trying to, you know, go after the Shazam family. Uh, Helen Mirren Ziolis, I believe Lucy Liu is the middle one, and then there's an even younger one. So they they run the game on ages <laughs> with there, but... It, yeah, I, I noticed uh, I was looking at the URL for the for the photo of uh, Helen Mirren, and I noticed yeah. that there was a there was a file name at the end of it of onset, you know, zero two zero three. So I changed it to zero three, and there's this hilarious photo of just her with Zachary Levi at a picnic table, and they're just like eating yeah. their cheeseburgers in their like very period uh, superhero yeah. costumes, which is just really funny to see somebody eat a cheeseburger dressed up like a you know an ancient god. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh this is a it's a documentary really Mike this is <laughs> they're just documenting this in real time over there, uh but yeah I mean again her armor I mean she's wearing armor she looks more like a, a warrior a, a battler if you will and um I don't know much about Hesper but I mean again we're in we're in a world of uh, gods and and monsters if you will uh, with with Wonder Woman and 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 Superman so it looks like they're borrowing a little bit of everything to kind of kind of throw it in here if you will so there's that. I didn't. I think we talked about the potentiality of a Nightwing movie before, Mike. But Chris McKay, who just did the Tomorrow War, said he was once developing the movie for Warner Brothers. Um, it seems optimistic that it could still become a reality. Um, hmm. I wouldn't be surprised this is like if like an a lot HBO of stuff, Max. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of stuff was or was wasn't one point in time and develop over at Warner Brothers. I mean, mm-hmm. they've gone through so many uh, th- so many uh, ebbs and flows and turmoil over there at that studio, like. I, even they were making the Ant May movie, which doesn't make any sense, you know. But yeah, they had no. they've had so much stuff in pre production yeah. over there, you know. Well, it seems like a lot of his, like how he wrote, like, oh, you know, he had a bad father figure, aka Batman, and he's kind of moved on to Bloodhaven instead of Gotham. It was kind of like taking the Titans, the TV show. Mm-hmm. So may, maybe his version doesn't come to life, but they could make another one later. See, I'm, I'm not saying you couldn't get a competent filmmaker and a you know a good writer. And to sit down and make a good Nightwing movie. But 
uh, you really need the history of a Batman character to really set off Nightwing because, like, he's a very um, a broody character. You know, he leaves Batman and the way that he fights crime to do it on his own. And I feel like you kind of need to set that up in a couple movies before you get that going. You know, I, I know it's not the exact same tone, but eventually when we get that Iron Heart, you know, TV show, there's going to be so much already pre-built into that world and that character because we've already had so much of Tony Stark and what his character was in the cinematic universe. So when we move on kind of to like sort of a successor, you know, there's going to be a lot more emotion behind it. Well, but we haven't really had a really stable Batman in a while to really spin off of a Nightwing. So, I, I, of course, I would prefer that, but, you know... Who knows if, you know, even Matt Reeves' Batman is going to be around long enough to spin off a Nightwing. Well, I would say um, the um, we get that really good in, in kind of a, the Falcon Winter Soldier. Like, Sam Wilson's been around since 2014, right? Like, we, we, we know the character. We know why he was chosen. And we kind of got to see that come to fruition, how he did it his way. So, I mean, you're right. Like, they can't just give us Nightwing and be like... Oh, yeah, he was once Batman's ward kind of thing. And you're like, that's weird. Like, why? We don't care about this character. You have an opportunity yeah. to, to take Dick Grayson from sidekick to standalone and superhero. There's, and there's such an interesting movie that you could make out of that, right? You know, Batman, this established hero that's been fighting in Gotham for a while, takes on a sidekick. Like, you know, we just assume that that's fact in a lot of comic books, right? But no one really questions, like... This is a child. He needs to be in, in the care of, like, loving parents. He shouldn't be out on the street running around fighting crime. You know, why would a hero let that be possible? So it'd be, it'd be interesting to explore that. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's kind of what they do with, like, a first Nightwing movie. They kind of take kind of the Netflix Daredevil approach where he doesn't technically call himself Nightwing or put on no. the Nightwing suit until, like, the very, very end of the movie. And really it's all about, like, it's the first two acts is him next to Batman the whole time you know is it, isn't that kind of titans though because he just wears the robin outfit until the end of the season i mean season. i've i've seen like maybe four episodes of titans i'm slowly not, looking my way through it i haven't not seen no batman yet though yeah. they talk about batman all the time but i ain't seen no batman yeah. yet but you will you will <laughs> I, you'll probably I, hate I, it but you'll see it <laughs> um but yeah I, again also batman forever did this mike duh do you not remember the like the thirty five year old Chris O'Donnell being cast as the now cold, that cold would be wild child. since we're dipping into all of these multiverses and worlds at some point in time you know Flashpoint unlocking all this stuff man to revisit another different Batman movie and like uh, spin off that night I mean bring back George Clooney and there could be a one off line about like mm-hmm. oh remember when we used to have nipples on our suits mm-hmm. my mm-hmm. Bat- my Nightwing suit is not gonna have it, a nipple anywhere on it. <laughs> His Nightwing credit card got declined um, for, <laughs> from not paying. But, oh, yeah, there, there's an opportunity here. They, they, they've got some there's some work to do, but they, there's an opportunity here. This might make you chuffed, Mike, and in a good way. <laughs> Smallville is in the news. Tom Welling says he's working on an animated continuation of the series with Michael Rosenbaum. Yeah, um, that that's crazy. Yeah, super fan of the show sent me this news uh, earlier in the week, and I, I'm still working my way through it. I'm I think I'm in season four, maybe season five. So I'm I haven't even quite reached the halfway point of Smallville, but. I mean, I constantly think about how these characters were involved in that project for like a decade of their life. And I feel like it's going to be kind of hard to sever yourself from those people and that family, whether you would want to or not. So if it comes back in an animated form, that would be really cool. I feel like I could add a lot more to the conversation if I knew how Smallville ended and I don't want to know yet because I'm still watching it. But uh, yeah, I would think I, cause I'm under the impression that it ends like right when he kind of decides to become Superman, you know, really kind of take on, I don't even know if he puts a suit on or what exactly happens, but you know, full time metropolis, I'm going to save the world type of deal. So be kind of cool to see where that goes. Uh, they're not going to get the voice actor back for Chloe because I think she's going yeah. to jail for being in a sex cult. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know if her character pers- persists in the universe, but they could always just recast her. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, anime is fine. I mean, they have, like I said, multiple comic seasons of uh, "quote unquote" Smallville. Right, uh, season eleven is a comic book. They could either adapt those. They could create their own stuff. But animation provides them an opportunity to bring back the original cast without being like, oh, you aged. 10 years or whatever. Yeah. And Tom, Tom Welling, he was in crisis on infinite earth, but like had like what? 30 seconds of screen time kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, and who knows? Uh, there's more of an acceptance, I guess, of 
adult animation than there ever has been before. I mean, it helps that it's going to be action based. I would assume since it's a uh-huh. Smallville with uh, superheroes, right? Hopefully, hopefully but, he's got all his powers by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, yeah, I mean, this all sounds really, really cool. You would have to take more of a mature take to it. I mean, not as grotesque, I'm sure, as Invincible, but you know, Invincible could be a good proving ground, right? You know, you yeah. show up to Warner Brothers and be like, look at all of the all of the craziness uh, that Invincible did on the internet. People love this. Let's bring back Smallville. You already got oh. your established audience, you know. Oh. You don't have to... We, d- we don't need to bring back all of the sets. We're just going to draw it all. I'm, I'm even, on board for this 100%. It, well, I, I'm a big... I'm a, I'm a much bigger fan of Michael Rosenbaum. Um, you know, oh, the, that, he, the he's great Lex. Yeah. yeah, he's great Lex. He, I mean, he, he has a podcast where he, he talks about stuff. Uh, really good. Um, I can't think of the name off my top of my head, but he, I, th- I, I like his work. I think he does great stuff. I, I would watch either an animated feature if they wanted to, more than a series. But yeah, I could see him do like an eight episode series, like you know, mm-hmm. you know, Smallville Revelations or whatever. The end of it, you know, wrap it up if how they want to wrap it up more if they want to. So it, it seems mm-hmm. to me, like I said, talking about Dexter, Dexter's getting a series, you know, much later. What was it? Um, Full House at Fuller House. <laughs> almost 20 years later like all these shows are bringing themselves back in like different ways and it's fine to do that like if they want to bring it back in an animated way because animation is the way of the future right now love it so um but i saw this news he's not really so there's no really confirmation there he said this in a video interview with somebody and like there's like no mm. real announcement yet so hopefully it does come to fruition for everybody and it's not yeah, just him I like, mean we're working on pre-production and it never comes, comes yeah through. I mean that's kind of how Hollywood works right you you kind of get the you kind of stir up the muck in the lake to kind of uh, get the party started you know now they can go into their next meeting saying like oh look at all look at look we were trending here briefly on an afternoon just because I talked about it for two seconds you know whoops I brought it up accidentally aren't you Glad of all the clicks we're getting to the Smallville wiki site now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'd be down. I'd be down for this. I think it's a good idea. Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford is going to kill himself, man. If he ends up <laughs> crashing an airplane, it's going to be filming something. He has injured a sh- he has injured his shoulder uh, during rehearsing for a fight scene uh, this week. He wasn't even doing it. He wasn't even filming. It. He was rehearsing for it, and now they're on a three week filming delay. Yeah, so, this harkens uh, back to uh, The Force Awakens uh, for me when he hurt himself. Yeah, the, I don't know if it was on the Millennium Falcon or if it was in the yeah. vicinity of it. The door, the door of the Millennium Falcon closed on his leg or something, or in one of the, I th- maybe it was maybe it was his crawler spaceship, the one that, that takes the Millennium Falcon in whenever he does mm-hmm. that. A door fell on his leg and he broke his leg. You know, I, I think you know this is this is a sign, man. Like he's, he's just got to be careful with them. Put him in bubble wrap. Let him out on set every once in a while. Put him back in the bubble wrap. Like uh, I, I, I'm not a huge. I, I don't know a whole lot about Harrison Ford, kind of as a person, as much as I just know he's kind of a curmudgeon, right? But like as much of as a as he comes off as a curmudgeon, like. Does he like doing this, right? Does he like this job? Like, he was famously kind of discovered as kind of like an on-set kind of carpenter, just like working man uh, for Star Wars. Yeah. You know, you know. so it, it just kind of makes me wonder, does he like well, to do this kind of work? He must if he's this old and he still wants to return to these characters yeah. that he's probably incessantly tired of people fawning over because <laughs> every time he goes on a talk show, he's always just like, I don't want to talk about this. I don't care. Uh, so it's just he's just kind of has this funny mythos yeah. around him. Well, I, I think he was in American Graffiti before Star Wars. Um, but, yeah, I guess that's true. But they, they do always talk yeah, about that story about how he yeah, was discovered, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think he was maybe a carpenter on one of, on American Graffiti more than Star Wars and then came into Star Wars. Either way, yeah, he always talks about how he hates his things. I think he, he talked how many times? Like, he's like, I'll only come back to Star Wars if you kill me kind of thing. And then they finally uh-huh. did it on in The Force Awakens. So, like, I think they're probably going to deal with Indiana Jones. Like, I will come back as Indiana Jones one more time. If you kill me off in this movie, because I don't want I'm tired of people asking me about it. It d- it's funny. It makes me think of like, I don't like, I'm really curious about, I would love to see like a biography of his life. Right. Because I think there was an anniversary of Blade Runner this week. Uh, and I've only ever seen Blade Runner like once. And I'm pretty sure it was the, it was not one of the directors or final cuts. So I really need to rewatch it. But I just keep thinking of like this young actor and some of the nerdiest sci-fi movies of all time just ends up being like an angry yeah. grandpa that keeps hurting yeah. himself. So, it's just yeah. a funny transition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was already like, what, 40 when he was filming Star Wars anyway. So, mm-hmm. uh, anyway, yeah. 
it's fine. I, I think he'll live. Uh, I just don't want to be the one to tell him, hey, Harrison, you can't wear your earring on set. Uh, you you <laughs> take it out when you're meeting Indiana Jones. I'd rather I'd rather rather not be that role, but we'll figure it out. Sandman, the show for Netflix, is filming the live action version. And the, there's a behind the scenes photo showing off actor uh, Tom Sturge as Morpheus. Uh, he looks like he might be in the band The Cure or um, playing for <laughs> Nine Inch Nails. But one of the cool things about the video where they got this from, it's a real fun insight into how, like, you know, scenes are filmed these days. Like, right? Like, uh, how film crews come together to film like, just a guy walking down the street, if you will. One, two, three. I'm counting at least four guys for this uh, shot because you got you need a guy on the camera. You need a guy on a boom. You need the guy on the uh, monitor the guy, that's monitoring the camera. Yeah. <laughs> And one guy it, guiding the camera fun. guy backwards. I, and that's just I, when the video starts. There's probably like three producers behind all of those people. Yeah. I mean, I, I would imagine, I mean, they had to go through light, probably light the scene pretty well too. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I've been in this role. I've, I've had a steady cam attached to my body walking backwards while someone guided me. So I didn't fall over my own ass with an expensive, <laughs> a, expensive camera. So I, I really understand this, but like, this is just a really fun way. Like, look how long that boom pole is. It goes over <laughs> like what? 20 feet probably. At yeah, least I guess it. Is... I guess it just sh- goes to show you uh, everything that goes in just a simple scene, right? Because you know, at some point in time, somebody probably recommended, "Why don't we just put like a lav mic on them? Then we don't have to get this boom <laughs> pole down this alleyway." It's like, no, 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 we can't hide the lav, and we also got to pick uh-huh. up on the ladies that are talking behind them, and we don't want to lav all of them up. We don't, we don't have all that. That guy, that union just, guy's not here today. We only have the boom guy, or you know, something like just, that. Just ADR. That's what I'm surprised they're not doing. Just. <laughs> yeah, get him, get him, get him doing natural sound and film it over later. But um, yeah, so I mean, this is this is a fun little thing. I don't think there's a lot to be taken off. He looks like how Morpheus slash Dream would look, you know, mm-hmm. in modern time. Black everything, pale skin, black medium length hair with the side part. Like he could be in what is he in like the band The Smiths maybe or <laughs> or Morrissey? I, I don't know, but it's it's fine. I, I I like the video how it was made. I thought that would be interesting to kind of throw in here if you guys want to take a look at that. That's in our show notes. The TV series Silk on Amazon Prime has hired Tom Spazzoli, uh, who was a producer for Watchmen, to be the showrunner. Last year's Watchmen show. Oh, HBO's Watchmen. I mean, that's yes. uh, I mean, that's good pedigree, right? But yep. I feel like and, my opinion still has not changed on this. Well, one. the other thing is Phil Lord and Chris Miller will oversee the series. They are now, I think, in charge of the Spider-Man a non-movie properties going on. At, at so Amazon. does that make, so does that just by default make this animated? I mean, I'm not saying that it's not two, animated. Okay. It, yeah. It, by it, that, it I'm not saying action. that they, I'm not saying that they couldn't handle something live yeah. action, but you know, yeah. So there, you know, the, 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 his boss, Tom's boss is Phil Lord and Chris Miller on this show. So does this having these names again, doesn't mean it's going to be the best show ever, but does that lean a little bit more like, okay, maybe they, they might have an idea here (laughs) more than we think they do. Maybe I kind of look at it as more like Lord Miller have a production company, right? They're working on their own projects that get the most love that they actually touch. And they're just like, Oh, you mean we can make more money if we just hire one of, you know, one of our friends or one of our acquaintances to work on this thing that Amazon is pitching to us. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and do it. That's kind of how I see it. Like I just, I, I can't harp on it anymore of just like, I don't know why this needs to be a thing. Mm. I mean, we can even attach it back to the Nightwing thing, right? Of just like, why do we need one of these like spinoff characters when we haven't really, really established in this world the character so, that they're really referencing, you know? So I think the the thing about Silk is, again, we talked about this last time, there's enough change in here that is not going to be Spider-Man adjacent. It's just going to be its own thing. And they're kind of like taking parts of it that that they want to, and I don't think this will be Spider-Man and Jason. I think it will be kind of its own thing, akin to how, um, oh, what's that show you just watched? It's at the top of our show notes. Uh, Sweet Tooth kind of is Tooth. akin it, It's akin to its own thing. It borrows stuff, but it, it takes some stuff out as well. This kind of that- feels like one of those shows that would have hit like mid to late, 2000s like in the tens 2010s if you will of just like oh wow we're getting a superhero tv show yeah it's this random spider-man character and uh, the spider-man's not going to be in it at all but just wait in episode four you're going to see like a sign in the background that says rocks on and it's going to be amazing we've never seen anything like this before and then that's it and i just feel like we're 
just going to be more of that, but we're it, in a totally different phase of superhero stuff, well, right? But, but it's not, I mean, even they said there's no spider, like, she's not being bit by the same spider. Like, the her origin story is going to be different. I don't think we're going to get any Spider-Man references. I think they're just trying to, like, what can we do with our properties and make something? And I feel, even because it, it'll be on Amazon and nothing else um, tied in the Spider-Man, that it will be separated enough where they, they can run it and it'll be okay we won't have to worry about that kind of stuff like i don't think this will be a connected show like the other ones will uh it could be wrong it could be proven wrong but i think everything you know that they've said that's made it feel like they've changed it enough and we're just going to be using the character um i forget her name um her superhero name is silk but whatever um her her character's name is i'm not gonna pull it up uh will be so um well, we'll give it a watch they, when they've it eventually got, lands on Amazon, yeah. Amazon Prime, and we'll see if we finish yeah. it, right? Yeah. It's got it's got better names than just someone they pulled off the street to do it, so knock on wood. I've got actually some props for our next bit here, and I know why would you have props <laughs> for a podcast, you may ask. Very important. So I'm going to go grab the mic. Can you, can you go ahead and tell them what our next topic is? Oh, I will wax poetically while you're grabbing what I can only assume is a toy because we're talking about Transformers and the next is film correct. is titled Rise of the of Beasts. The Beast. So, And I'm curious, is this one of those like straight to Netflix animated things? Or is this like this an actual movie. like, this are, we gonna see, movie. are we going to see John Cena in this is what mm-hmm. I'm g- getting at, right? Because he was in Bumblebee. And I can only assume his character will persist, persist through this franchise now. Um, actually, I no. don't know if he dies in Bumblebee. Do they kill people in Bumblebee? That's a good question. I don't know if they've actually they actually murder people in that movie or not. But I'd have to go. I'd have to go watch that one. So this one is um, the the next in the current. It says it's a direct sequel to Bumblebee, but I think it's pretty much in 1994, so it's different. Um, okay. But the 90s were very popular for not just the Transformers, but their spinoffs, the Beast Wars, Mike. Um, the production, the the animated TV show from the '90s. I believe you've watched it, right? You're you've got mm-hmm. fond memories of Beast Wars. So I actually have here. I was able to pick up this weekend the Megatron as a T Rex toy. The transforming. Oh wow! Megatron How big is it? T-Rex. Um, half as tall as my iMac monitor. Oh wow! <laughs> so it's it's actually pretty big. And then the other one I got was um the what most people thought was optimus prime it's not optimus primal who's actually a different character <laughs> than optimus prime by the way so i have get him it right as well. nerds he transforms into a monkey now i love beast wars i could go all day <laughs> about beast wars enough that i have these these expensive um kingdom war for cybertron transformers uh, from beast wars that i i, I get on for i think this is um I, this does not make me that much more excited for this movie because the live action ones usually aren't good. However, did you like Into the Heights? Yeah, it was okay. I, yeah, main, I, I, had, I had a good time. The main actor is the lead actor for Transformers: Rise of the Beast. Oh so, yeah, that that, that, Anthony that had a good performance. Yeah, yeah. I think this will be fine. It'll be fun. Um, but like the way they did like the Dinobots back in like the what the fourth Transformers movie <laughs> doesn't make me feel like they're gonna do this with any justice to Beast Wars. It's just like it, it's just really crazy yeah. on the face of it. If you if you've never heard me go on this rant before of just like okay it makes sense you're coming to Earth you need to hide you need to go incognito you're a giant robot okay I'll hide inside of a car it's kind of a large machine. It makes sense. Yeah. The scales usually kind of remain the same, right? Like Optimus is kind of one of the bigger Transformers. So his base car is a semi truck. And you got some yeah. of the smaller ones like Bumblebee, which are shorter. They, they take the size of a Camaro. And you can have a little bit of artistic license, right? Of just like, oh, well, there are these alien machines. So you can cram a lot more metal inside of that shape, right? But it's just like a gorilla. Like mm-hmm. uh, no one's going to believe that a, uh, that a normal gorilla is going to transform into something so- gigantic gigantic and towering with stature so it's just really funny i'm just trying to think like how is the how is the person in charge of the charge of the visuals of this film supposed to explain how a gorilla which is slightly larger than a human is supposed to transform into something that i don't know was 20 30 40 feet tall yeah well they could be smaller they they have rhinox who transformed into rhinoceros and air razor who transformed into falcon have been mentioned for this now it could be one of the two things here maybe these are um again 
when they came to Earth the first time, it was like way years ago, and they didn't have cars, right? Maybe they've been in stasis since then. They love to put <laughs> robots in stasis, Mike. Did you not know that? That's how you bring them up later. They oh, land yeah, wasn't earlier. one of them like the Knights of the Round Table? Wasn't that in one of the later Transformers? Uh, oh, movies yeah. Too? Yeah, they've been flying across. They were bringing the whole planet that was a Transformer to, to Earth. I don't know how they're going to do it. I'm not thrilled that they're doing Beast. I, I love Beast Wars, <laughs> but I'm not exactly you know, very excited it, they're doing Beast Wars. If here. you're not familiar with the cartoon, it makes more sense because yes. it's primal times. Like, I don't know exactly what, you know, Asia, the planet, but there's no humans like, around, right? Well, there like was it, like, yeah. <laughs> well, there's like a couple like Neanderthals, but like that's oh, it. Oh, was like, there? Okay. Yeah, like there's like an episode where they're like, oh, we got to protect these Neanderthals, but that was it. Now you never saw them again, but like, you know, you're, you're dealing with like, you know, Stonehenge was some sort of robotic transformer thing that, turned half of them into trans metals right it was to sell toys they didn't care what they really were in the story they're like we got these <laughs> toys we're making how can you make this work um but it was cool because again optimus prime was a um a, a, a t-rex there was the velociraptor um gentleman who was he called what was his name <laughs> gentleman um, was that starscream that was the no no that Star- was the pterodactyl right yeah, no, no. Starscream didn't make it. Uh, since this was like the future, but they traveled to the past. Starscream was dead. He came back as a ghost in one of the episodes. Um, it, it was it? It's not Dinos. I don't know. I'll come up with it later. But like <laughs> you know, like Rhinox. What his name is Rhinox, and he just happens to turn into a rhinoceros. Like you're just selling toys at this point. But um, I'm excited to to see kind of the, the do the transforming and see what they do. But like I'm not like I'm not really sold on this being the Maximals and Predacons against each other. But I love the toys. God, give me the toys all day, man. So that's what I got for the Transformers. Dune uh, has been delayed three weeks, Mike. You're losing sleep over right. this, aren't you? <laughs> um, apparently this is now coming out October 22nd, which is the same day as the French Dispatch, Last Night in Soho, and Jackass 4. Yeah, If I remember right, the French Dispatch is... Um the next movie from Wes Anderson. Yes. And Last Night in Soho is the next movie from, uh, uh, you know, Scott Pilgrim. Edgar director. Wright. Edgar Wright. Yeah, Edgar Wright. So, like, these are already, like, two big, iconic directors that are coming out with new films. Jackass 4, uh, that, that's just a lineage of films. I mean, that's a huge weekend, man. Mm. Well, Timothy Chalamet, the lead actor of Dune, is also the lead actor of The French Dispatch. Mm-hmm. Like they, they they've got. I think they're gonna. Someone someone's gonna give here. I've not seen a a trailer since 2020 for the French Dispatch. Um, I think that one will probably get the biggest delay because it doesn't have a release date yet, or a, a, a big trailer yet. Whereas um, last night in Soho had a pretty big trailer release a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I I haven't seen any trailers uh, for Jackass Four. I wouldn't be surprised yep. if, if I think that it got moved delayed at all too. I think well, I think uh, well I think Johnny Knoxville broke his leg or something or somebody somebody did something and they had him delay it so yeah. uh, production well, so that's probably now, moved. now with delays and moving things seem things seem to be a little bit more strategical right like in the last year it's all been about you know avoiding the disasters of the infection of COVID but now that things are starting to open up now the studios are just like okay well now we really need to think about maximizing profits because we're kind of leaving this kind of financial window of being able to write things off on our taxes and now these films actually have to generate legit revenue or we can't be a studio you know forever unless movies are selling tickets so yeah somebody's gonna budge someone's gonna move to a more preferential date at some point in time yeah you know maybe jackass moves to like february you know maybe valentine's day one of those weird valentine's what? Like rated r releases like next year why why is jackass just not on paramount plus <laughs> like, 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 mean, like like this is not the one of those movies like i need to go see in theaters like I I, I, put I, it on the I mean it might be I've I've heard I heard some people when they were talking about this this week that it's a theater going experience right you want to be in a room with a lot of people when you watch this kind of yeah. grotesque stuff happening you know when you're watching people getting kicked in the privates or you know you're watching hooks going in and I out of people I don't mean fifty year old <laughs> men getting kicked in the groin in the theaters man like these guys are up there in age they're not they're not they're not getting younger it's for sure elder abuse I say. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, this is shaping up to be the busiest movie release day of the year. So we'll see until someone see which one gives. October. That's the Venom yeah. month. Last I checked, uh, so uh, someone might be is rewriting it? that October record. Well, didn't didn't the first Venom movie come out in October? Not Venom two. I'm talking about the first yeah, one. Yeah, Venom. Yeah, I feel yeah, like Venom, Venom, Venom laid. 
that laid claim to that month yeah. uh, after I Vidim- think it chapter one originally had it. Yeah, Venom two is uh, September twenty fourth, so it could lead in October. It could lead in October. Um, it, and YouTube knows what I was looking. It was like related to Venom, Let There Be Carnage, and Jackass four. I'm like, I don't need a. I don't need to know about either of those movies. But Legendary, the producer of Dune, was not happy with HBO's Max's release date date on, on Max in, in the theaters. But apparently that's not the cause of delay. They're also showing this at Toronto Film Festival on September 3rd. So I expect reactions to be out pretty early for this movie. But mm. um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I'm excited to see it. I read the book. Mike, I don't I don't know how you feel. It might just be something. I don't know anything on. about Dune except, yeah. like, they have, like, I keep seeing screenshots where actors have, like, nose pieces like i don't know if it's like yes. an oxygen supply that goes in their yep. nose i don't know what's going on here yeah it yeah it's so they can live out on the sand dunes the sand dunes, dunes. <gasps> that's why it's okay <laughs> go, at least for, all right uh let's jump into our last bit here it is time for the loki section of the show mike again we are closer to the next episode than we were in the last one i got i always gotta Speaking remember to take notes of alien planets mm-hmm. loki episode three yeah i uh so, again, this is spoilers for anyone who doesn't know. If you've not watched this, get out, go watch it, come back. Um, this felt to me uh, like a episode of Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> You're not I don't, the first person I've heard that from. Uh, I've watched I, I get on, I've watched Doctor Who. There's a very nondescript planet that's going through a crisis. They're talking to the locals, and they need to get off the planet, and they need to find, like, a power supply thing. Um, I, I thought this was... Um, I, I liked how this one episode picked up. I thought the last one was, was like the door was open for Loki to go talk to Sylvie and be like, she's leaving it open so she could like bait him into some conversation, but she just didn't know the door was open behind her as he, mm-hmm. she kind of ran through it. And um, what in the the revelation that she her powers don't work in the in the TVA that was like I, I guess I'm like oh she'd never really been to the TVA so um, mm-hmm. that that was fun for her to find out and then we get to see. Uh, some stuff here. I have a theory about this episode. Before I, I, I read this theory, and I'm, I'm, I'm fully on, or I heard this theory. I'm fully on board with this, Mike. Do you want to know my theory for this? Yes. What's, okay. what's your theory for this episode? Because it ties in the, the intro to this episode started with Sylvie essentially doing happy hour with this girl over and over again to get information out of her, right? Because she mm-hmm. she mind controlled her. Well, there's this a part in this where Sylvie tries to mind control Loki, and he says, "Well, that." And he's like, "What are you doing? That doesn't work on me." I think this whole episode is in Loki's mind. Like she yeah, is yeah. actually controlling him and we're just led to believe they're like in dire straits on this planet and she's trying to get the Tim pad from him. Yeah, that idea did come across in my mind because they, they bring it up later again in the episode of just, okay, Loki says, oh, how exactly does your mind control work? And she says, well, if the mind's stronger, I kind of have to go through more of these machinations. I have to make yeah. the web a little bit more uh, a little bit more confusing. And- it takes a little bit longer. Uh, and, it, and it seems like it, 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 if it's not happening in this episode like you think it is, it wouldn't shock me if it happens at some point in time. Because really, as, so, as, a, as someone in the audience, we don't really know how we don't really need to know how she got the information out of that kind of foot soldier. Right. You know, right. We, everyone just assumes that like she she is or isn't a Loki or however you want to describe her. We get it. She has magic. You know, I'm not surprised yeah. that she could just like touch somebody's head and get the information out of it. We don't need to go into it. But the fact that they went into it means that they did it for That's a reason. A- so. So well, they call the, it a the Chekhov's, only, a Chekhov's gun. Like you yeah, show that yeah. to us, so you have to use it later. Yeah, exactly. So the the fact that we're seeing it, the only thing that I wouldn't like, right, is I thought a lot of the stuff that happened in this episode was really, really cool, right? We get to go yeah. to like an alien planet. We get to see a moon fracturing. We kind of get this cool one one oneer as one, they call long take, kind the long of take. at the end. I yeah, yeah, I know it's kind of like a fake one because there's lots of stuff that cut across the camera to hide edits and you but, know everything on this planet. And it is like half CG anyway in camera, but either way, it was cool. I kind of like the stakes. I want to yeah. know how they, I want to know how they get out of this, right? You yep. know, we we thought that they were gonna get energy for the Tim Pad, but then the Tim Pad breaks, so they're gonna try to hop on this freighter to get off of the planet. I, you know, so if all blows, this ends yeah. up. If all of this ends up being fake, I feel like, oh, did I just kind of like almost waste watching this episode? I guess we learned a couple of things. We we learned uh, Loki's bisexual. We mm-hmm. learned a little bit more about the uh, well, about the past from yeah. um, oh, well, what's what's her name again? Uh, Sylvie. 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 Yeah. Well, so uh, I I just hope all of this fun adventure that we experience doesn't lead to kind of nothing, right? I would hate to have all of this grand adventure happen and then it just kind of cuts to them just like 
in a tool shed somewhere yeah. and they're just like, oh yeah, I was just messing with your brain. We're still well, at this uh, supermarket, right? Um, yeah. Well, I, I don't th- know if they, they, they could pull it off. Well, I, I think suppose. I think there's opportunity here because again, the reason why, why I like that theory is because they have a happy hour on the train later, right? In that same one for one convo where they're sitting and talking across the table about each other, like learning about each mm-hmm. other because um, if they, I think the next episode would be like, oh, she, he broke the tin pad. Okay. Well, we're going to start over and they have to relive this like quicker. It's not the whole episode again, but like, oh, we're going to go through the bullet points because she has been through this crisis or I guess this extermination event so many times that she knows kind of what to do with it and kind of feed mm-hmm. him through it. Well, the, the only bigger- thing that seems the only thing that seems a little confusing though, it kind of seems like a hat on a hat now, right? Yeah. Because like not only are we dealing with like time travel and going to these different kind of fractured time pieces and going back and just living within this kind of apocalypse, now on top of all of that, we're going to delve into like mind control, yeah. which means technically they're not really there at all. They're not yeah. even real this might not even be a real pa- planet, it might not even be a real apocalypse. It's just something that, you know, Sylvie's yeah. uh, going well, in her mind so I, all i'm saying is it sounds like there's a tight rope to walk and yeah. i this feels like the first episode like i know they've kind of all ended a little bit on like a cliffhanger well i say all yeah. there's only three of them but this is the first one that's really ended on like oh no we're, there's there's still a lot more to go we have not really yeah. finished up this chapter it, it, well and and that's the that's the halfway point of the series right we are halfway through the show sadly because mm-hmm. i think i think it's 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 building off everyone i liked the the conversational pieces in this one again every episode's had a conversation right but i think the loki versus loki you know conversations how they how they've talked to each other and learned why they're kind of different was very fun we again we're at the halfway point the stakes are at their highest and their hope is at their lowest right now um because it ship blew up and that's the you know, standard storytelling and I, I think they're doing a great job because these actors both of them sylvie and loki are are, are selling their roles yeah. the whole way if through I- if, if I had to make a guess, um, I would think that uh, um, Owen Wilson shows up, saves yeah. them, you know, just before the planet explodes, you know, says something along the lines of, oh, man, we got here just in time. You're lucky. We had to check like so many oh. apocalypses before we found this one. So you're lucky we're here. We saved you. And then just like Chekhov's mind control, maybe that bit shows up maybe in the second to last episode yeah. or the last episode. And then kind of that's when we, we see it kind of after we've already forgotten about I, the trick yeah. a little bit. I saw I saw a uh, people are like oh it's not really Sylvie's not really a Loki she's she's the enchantress or another character well I've seen uh, the upcoming like the halfway season trailer and there's like a a baby version of Sylvie which is in like the Loki garb with the dark hair coming up so again that's confirmed she she kind of is Loki. Uh, I saw uh, I saw a one off kind of parody web comic where somebody was just like, oh, why don't they get out of there with the Tesseract? And I was like, yeah. well, I, I guess that's true. If Loki still has that on him, yeah. I guess they could use that they, to get out of there because it can't time travel, but it can spatially travel, you know, which is yeah. what they really need at that moment. Right. Well, if it is, in fact, the same universe. Uh, yeah, I think, that that's true. Yeah, because there were tons maybe, of those stones in there. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe the tesseract only works within. Yeah, like you said, the universe in which it was created. So yeah, well, I, I think the other thing is they kind of glossed over it. I think it's it will come back up bigger. But um, they said that every employee at the TVA is in fact a variant. Mm-hmm. Um, they were not created by the the timekeepers and that was kind of glossed over and i think you know that that also gives me vibes of like this isn't like really the whole story because they didn't go into that too much like if it's mind control she wouldn't have all the answers she would just know say it move along to the next bu- next bullet point of, of getting out of here but i think that's going to come back and we're going to find like you know who's owen wilson a variant of like are we going to see the original owen wilson is he a jet ski lover and he's going to get a ride that jet ski. Really. Oh, yeah, that's true. I, and, and I do like that additional bit because not only are we adding a little bit more drama and kind of vilifying these timekeepers a little bit more, uh, these kind of like not faceless beings, but we if they're seen there, wink, but, wink. <laughs> yeah, but that was actually kind of a criticism of the show that has kind of been kind of bubbling up in the background. But now it's kind of been fixed in my brain of I felt like I couldn't emotionally connect to any of these people that worked at the TVA. Right. Like, why do I care about how Owen Wilson feels? Why do I care about this dude that's always kind of getting uh, that, you know, almost got his uh, Loki almost like beat his ass in the first episode. Right. And he's like, I need to know what a fish is. 
is so I can understand what gutting me will mean. I need to. So like, even though all this stuff was funny, I was like, well, I can't emotionally connect to any of these workers because these are all just kind of like weird mm-hmm. things created. Like, are they human? Whatever they are, they're just kind of like just extensions of the timekeepers. They're just these mindless drones that don't have, you know, if a soul exists, they might not have them. But now that I know that they're actual people, that they are variants, you know, these are human beings that have yeah. thoughts that are it, so now i'm like okay now there's a now they've added even more stakes so when well, i see these people that's probably the solution is like they're not watching like one master time like we just pull the variants in we make them work for us and they don't know that because we brainwash them you know after so long and then that, the timeline kind of fixes itself if we just pull the variants together but i imagine possibly by the end of this all those variants are going to get out something's going to happen to these people they're going to find out their variants and shit's gonna go sideways, Mike. And yeah, this this I'm is excited. this is <laughs> this is like the the um the kind of phrase of waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? Yeah, we're building up to something really big here that we know is going to uh, fan out and connect to other MCU stuff in the property. So that's a big question I have: is how much of a resolution are we gonna have at the end of episode six? Right? You know, there may or may not be a second season of Loki. Right? We're not a hundred percent sure. We we have feelings that there might be a second season. And I kind of, I'm starting to feel like, you know, if they kind of needed like a formula or a direction to go, I love kind of like this, this buddy cop situation between uh, Loki and And, uh, and he can go anywhere. That's the best part about Loki. Like he's not tied to the main timeline, if you will. So that works for me there. But if this is supposed to have greater implications for the movies and stuff going forward, I do wonder how much of a resolution we'll get in episode six. You know, yeah. you know, is the main resolution going to be that Loki's kind of more of a chaotic good now and shifting away from, you know, the evil side of like that D&D spectrum. And, you know, that's kind of our emotional wrap up. Yeah. And then stuff's still haywire. And then it says, OK, now go get your tickets for uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness because uh, this show is wrapped up. So we'll see how it goes, yeah. but overall, I'm still having a great time. And yeah. do we do we have any confirmation if this is or isn't being filmed in a volume? Because it is not. I feel like a okay, because I feel like a lot of these shots that have been happening on this planet, I was like, this looks like a volume yeah. to me. But yeah. maybe they're you know they're just doing it the harder way, right, on a green screen, and then they're adding that stuff in in post. Yeah, I, I think they film most of Loki before they even had like this before they even thought about building a second volume kind of thing um but like again if they film can make doctor who look exactly like this i'm sure they could figure it out pretty quickly it's probably the same studio that then and, and like pinewood or whatever uk where they're like oh we're gonna film doctor who oh well we'll film loki there an hour later but it felt mm-hmm. very much like a do- it would even look like a doctor who episode throughout the whole thing which is fun i love a good homage this was a great i think it was great a lot of pe- I, I heard a lot of people were kind of down on this one they're like, oh, this is the filler episode. I'm like, that, there was a lot of action, though. Like, there was a lot, of, a lot of moving forward on this. And it was good to see, you know, less of the TVA for once. Like, to pull them out for a minute and be like, what does Loki and what does Loki and Loki do uh, when they're on the run? Mm-hmm. So, um, I'm excited to kind of see where it goes, see, see a little bit more, uh, and and get to, you know, figure out what what's at the top of this food chain, if you will. How does it all crumble down? And what are the next steps? Because obviously we want we want them all back, uh, mm-hmm. all of them later. So that's it for that. Anything else, Mike? Episode three, you good? We good? That that's it. Like man, Wednesday is so around the corner. I love three it. Three sleeps to Loki, episode four. That's what we're looking at. All right. Well, that's it for the show. If people want to know what you're up to, what you're doing, where can they find you at? Well, they can find me at Mike Royer Design, and you can read my web comics at pickledcomics.com. Go check out my uh, my Twitter because I'm going to be putting up pictures of that weird ass Shang Chi cake uh, here probably tomorrow. But Chris, if people want to check it out, I still need to see your cake. I need to yeah. see what yours ended up looking like. Uh, where can they find you, Chris? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Valdan V A L D A N, or Instagram, Valdan eighty uh, seven. People want to know more about the show. Uh, we've got, you know, we're back. We're getting about to get in review season, Mike. They need to, they need to queue up, get ready for our reviews. Where can they find all of our shows and notes at? Oh, find us at our home destination at SuperheroSlate.com. This is the best place to find the avenues we host our show and to get our awesome show notes. So there's only one place. Well, I, technically there's two places you can find that Shang-Chi uh, recipe, right? If you have that cookbook from the 70s or just head on over to our show notes. We have the that there, the links to all these trailers that we talked about. What a great time, our show notes. You'll have a blast. Mm-hmm. SuperheroSlate.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, wherever else you love to listen to find podcasts like our own. Please like 
like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can get merch at superheroslate.com slash store. We love hearing from you. Thanks for reaching out. Uh, thanks, super fan Jim, for letting me know about that uh, Smallville animated uh, reunion. Hopefully that we'll be seeing soon. So if you guys have any insider info, anyone out there, no matter where you live, what industry you work in, if you have the goods let us know. Odds are we've probably gotten to it already because Chris is always on top of this, but you never know. Sometimes mm -hmm. stuff falls through the cracks. So we love our insiders out there. If you're an insider, you're definitely a super fan. So if you want to be a super fan of this podcast, all you have to do is share the show with a friend, share the show with a buddy, make sure you are vaccinated, and we will be here every week, folks. That's right. We will see you guys next week. Bye. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. If you ain't got much, we can jump in at like 30 seconds, and I won't have to change the time codes. Oh, oh my God. okay. <laughs>